Yeah, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this session, uh, which is organized by Infect Control, Strong Together Against Infections. My name is Axel Brackhage. I'm the spokesperson, and I'm based at the Leibniz Institute for Natural Product Research and Infection Biology, the Hans Knoll Institute in Jena. Now, what is Infect Control? Infect Control follows follows not only an interdisciplinary approach, but rather a transdisciplinary approach to fight infections. And this also is reflected in the One Health approach. When you, when you see this, when you look at, the, at infections, of course, it's very important to deal with infections of humans and to carry out medical research. But at the same time, we also have to keep in mind the health of animals and also the the transfer of pathogens between humans and animals. And also we have to, to consider agriculture and the environment. And this is basically what One Health means, not only to consider humans, but also the well-being of animals and the environment. Also in infect control, we have included, of course, industry uh, companies from industry, which is very important, for instance, for further development of drugs or vaccines. We have included also climate research to discuss questions, what are the pathogens of the future? Where do they come from? And also very important, what we can see today in the corona pandemics, communication research. What is the reason that quite some people, some individuals are opposed against vaccination, although vaccination has, has presumably saved more lives than any other therapy? Again, also we have to to include or we have included healthcare, which also covers epidemiology. And we are also very proud that we have people who are thinking about transportation. And as you know, now a virus today, nowadays can travel around the whole globe within days, but also architecture. And this is for instance, to raise questions like how should a hospital of the future uh, look like to prevent infections or even rooms, patient rooms in these hospitals. And this all together is aimed at infect control to, to contribute to inhibition, to prevention, and to therapy of infectious diseases. Infect control is a Germany-wide consortium which combines science, society, and industry. It was founded in East Germany because it is funded by a special program of the Federal Ministry of Education and Research called Unternehmen Region. It was established in 2015. It, it covers now a total of 37 projects. We have 34 industry partners, 28 scientific partners, and just recently we established five so-called innovation laboratories. And as you can see here, these are main players in red, but also in white you see places and cities with groups co contributing to infect control. And in red, you can see here Berlin, of course. You can see Greifswald in the Insel, the island of Reims, <laughs> and Braunschweig, Jena, and Würzburg. Now, I just would like to give a spotlight on one project, and then we will hear additional projects, of course, during this session. And this is the development of new tuberculosis antibiotic. And as we know today, we have about 1.8 million people dying every day of tuberculosis. And what we observe increasingly are highly resistant tuberculosis bacteria, so-called MDR, but even XDR, that is resistance against all available drugs. At our institute in Jena, luckily, we discovered a new compound, which is called benzothiocyanone, which is active against XDR tuberculosis pathogens. This uh, compound targets uh, or addresses a novel target. So by investigating this compound, we could even discover a new target. And by a lot of money from infect control, but also together with the German Center of Infection Research, and also by the Free State of Thuringia, we could raise a lot of money to carry out preclinical trials and also clinical trials phase one and now phase two is ongoing and all this is in collaboration, in close collaboration with the, um, with the Institute of Tropical Medicine at the university clinics in Munich and the company which is called Hapila in Thuringia. And this helped us to produce kilograms of these compounds under G GMP conditions. 
And also we developed a tablet of 250 milligrams, uh, which can be used now in patients. And we are looking forward to the further development of this compound. Now, we are also dealing, of course, with Corona, and we also finance a couple of Corona projects. And just to give you some examples, one is that we also are looking for architectural solutions. So the development of structural solutions to reduce the entry of the pathogen in hospitals or senior residences. And this is, this is headed by Wolfgang Sunder at the Technik University in Braunschweig, together with Peter Gastmeier at the Charité. Or oh, we have a very nice childcare study, study that is to monitor inf infection incidences in childcare facilities. And for instance, to raise questions like which monitoring concepts can reduce the spread of infection. And this is headed by Oliver Kutzer in Würzburg together with other, with other places of infect control, also with the Charité and also with the Inselrins, with the FLI. And the last project I just would like to briefly mention is also devoted to therapy. And what we try is to develop novel therapeutic concepts against SARS-CoV-2. And for instance, by activation of human immune cells to recognize and eliminate the virus particles in the body. And this is headed by myself in Jena together with the FLI at, on, the, in the, on the island of Reims. This as a short summary of that, what we have been doing in infect control. And now it's my great pleasure that we start with the first uh, talks of this session. And the first speaker is uh, Professor Oliver Kutzai, who is the Director of Medical Microbiology at the University of Würzburg, at the same time group leader at our institute in Jena, and also the head of the National Reference Center for Invasive Mycosis. Oliver, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Axel, um, for organizing this meeting and uh, also for the invitation. Um, I, I would have preferred to meet all of the team uh, in Berlin and uh, get a chance to meet with everyone in person and discuss our ongoing projects. But uh, of course, you all know that this is not um, possible at the moment. So we have to deal with this uh, situation. You also heard that even a consortium like Infect Control that was founded well before the emergence of coronavirus now has a lot to do with this uh, um, current challenge in infectious diseases. And I guess that's true for uh, all of the people that are just uh, sitting here and organizing this meeting. But despite this, I think it's important that we must not forget other challenges in infectious diseases. And um, my uh, uh, task is now to somehow devise you from coronavirus and talk about fungal pathogens. And uh, the overarching topic of this session is um, One Health. And uh, One Health is uh, the concept that Axel has just introduced. And that is a concept, in my opinion, which is uh, exemplified actually by fungal pathogens. Now, fungi is a massive group of organisms um, that are ubiqu ubiquitous in, in, in nature. Everywhere you find fungi more than 1 million species. And these fungi fulfill essential functions in nature. And I cannot go into detail with that, but uh, many of you will be aware that there is essential symbiosis between fungi and roots of many plants, enabling, for example, the growth of forests and trees. And most of this would not be possible without this symbiosis. And also in, in degradation of natural substances, fungi play a very important role. And one example for this is, of course, wood that could not be degraded in nature, actually, uh, be it not for uh, the ability of fungi to degrade lignin. Now, with all these functions in nature, fungi can also infect humans. And uh, if you look at this from an ecology point of view, this is very rare to occur, especially the invasive fungal infections are very rare compared to the abundance of fungi in nature. But if they occur, they mainly affect um, patients that have underlying diseases uh, that are immunocompromised and can cause um, a, a high mortality and uh, often aggravate the underlying conditions. And you can see here the major fungal pathogens, which is Cryptococcus, uh, Candida, Aspergillus, or the Mucoralis. And a lot of these fungal pathogens actually do have sources in the environment, as you would expect from a group of organisms that is so ubiquitous. So uh, some fung fungal pathogens are uh, linked to, to pigeons and their droppings 
Others emerge from um, uh, decomposing organic materials and compost types. And others, again, are associated with plants and can be transferred, for example, by trauma um, inflicted by thorns in bushes or whatever. So uh, many fungal infections, not all of them, but many come from the environment. And one important example, and this is just the project I want to introduce today, uh, come from the environment. And, and Aspergillus fumigatus, the most important um, pathogenic mold in Germany that causes in invasive infection, is a prototype type example for this coming from the environment. And then we inhale uh, small uh, structures built by this fungal pathogen. And this mainly uh, causes a lung infection in immunocompromised hosts. So normal humans, healthy humans will in most cases not be inf inflicted, although we all inhale spores of this pathogen every day. But um, immunocompromised patients can get severe and devastating infection. Now, the treatment of these uh, infections has been complicated in uh, recent years due to the emergence of resistance. And we all know about antimicrobial resistance in bacteria, and we all know that this is a major challenge. But uh, in recent years, we've also seen emergence of resistance in fungal pathogens. And uh, although uh, the resistance I'm going to talk about is just for one class of antifungals, the azoles and aspergillus fumigatus, uh, it still has a massive impact on treatment of these infections because the azoles are the single first line choice for invasive infection due to Aspergillus fumigatus. If they cannot be used for treatment, it has uh, dr dramatic and direct consequences for the outcome of the disease. Now, where does azole resistance come from in Aspergillus fumigatus? And soon an hypothesis occurred that this is due to the use of azole antifungals in agriculture. Now, as I said, a lot of fungi are plant associated. Some of them cause disease in plants and some of these diseases um, can lead to losses in, in agriculture for diverse kinds of crops uh, or fruits or wine. And therefore azoles are used to control these plant pathogenic fungi. Note that Aspergillus fumigatus is not a plant pathogen by itself. So none of these agricultural azoles are targeted against Aspergillus fumigatus, however, um, Aspergillus fumigatus is a bystander that is uh, present everywhere in the soil and uh, in organic materials, and therefore it will be exposed to these azoles just uh, because they are used for plant pathogens in agriculture. Now, this is a map that we calculated in infect control, showing the fraction of districts that is hypoth hypothetically treated with azoles, and you can see that there is a massive use of, of azoles in Germany, and especially uh, people have talked about a belt here going right through uh, Germany, where uh, use of azoles uh, tends to be even higher due to the um, usage of, um, um, of, of land areas. And the black triangles mark farms where we actually sampled soil for three consecutive years. And it's important for the sake of the study that we sampled soil in organic farms where azole use uh, cannot take place, it's banned, and in conventional agriculture where um, typically two to four applications of azoles occur during one harvesting period. Now, let me show you some examples, and this is all very recent, just accepted last week uh, for publication. And the first thing is here, compare abundancy of Aspergillus fumigatus in soil of these fields, and you can see in organic fields where no azoles are used, the population of Aspergillus fumigatus stays roughly constant throughout the year. And if you compare this to conventional fields where fungicide application occurs typically during May to July, you can see that this fungicide application and a lot of this, not all of this, but a lot of this is azoles, uh, leads to a massive drop in the population. But the population is actually restored in autumn. So Aspergillus is either reintroduced to the field or can regrow from the samples. Now, what uh, effects did we uh, observe on resistance? And this is difficult to tackle. And I show you the results first for the agricultural azoles. And what you can see here is that the uh, inhibitory ability of the agricultural azoles uh, in uh, all cases actually increases. So uh, after azole exposure, the average Aspergillus population on the field is less susceptible to azoles than it was before. Um, however, this uh, should not be termed resistance because this is just an increase uh, in, in, uh, in the ability of the fungus to withstand the, um, 
the, the drugs not a bona fide resistance. And if you look at the uh, human azoles, you can see, and this is not unexpected to, to, due to the similarity of the substances, that also the susceptibility to the um, medical azoles decreases and you tend to get uh, strains that have higher uh, minimal inhibitory concentrations, for example, for itraconazole or for voriconazole. However, this is really, really low frequency and typically 1%, uh, maximum 3%, often less than 1% of the uh, uh, cultured Aspergillus fumigatus strains show resistance to medical azoles. And it's also an effect that is reversed in autumn and then you start back with the lower susceptibility, arguing against uh, stable mutations in the population. And this is actually also um, confirmed by a large scale whole genome sequencing of many, many Aspergillus fumigatus strains from the environment where we could not detect any stable effect of fungicide application in uh, the population of Aspergillus fumigatus. And our current in interpretation is that the use of azole, azoles in agriculture probably does not create enough selective pressure to really select resistant mutants. And this would pose us to actually look for resistance emergence in areas where more azoles are applied in a higher dosage. And this is example, uh, for example, too, in, uh, in, in flower growing, so uh, decorative flowers. flowers. Now, I've, I'm already at the end, but I want to mention that what I showed here is true for, for Aspergillus, a non-plant associated human pathogen. It's also true for other fungal species that can cause disease in humans. And I'm just going to mention Fusarium species here that cause a, a dramatic form of uh, corneal infection. And this is a plant associated pathogen as well. And we also have multi-resistance in uh, Fusarium. So taken together, I hope that in, in these few minutes, I could convince you that fungal infections are indeed a one health challenge. Uh, these pathogens switch between environment and humans. We do see emergence of drug resistance and that is most likely linked to use of antifungal drugs outside human medicine. And therefore, I think uh, also for fungal infections, like for all, all other diseases, we need to tackle a, a one health approach to really deal with these infections. Thank you very much for your attention. Oliver, thank you very much for this really interesting data and also by helping to solve this long lasting question, what is the transfer of azo resistance from agriculture, which is also a political issue, of course, from agriculture to, let's say, to human, to hospitals. Um, I also would like to encourage the, the audience, the participants here, if you have any questions, please send us via the chat room by F&A send us your questions and of course we will discuss them here. We have maybe one minute for questions and may I ask Oliver because I'm very much interested in this study and I really think it's a very nice example how to study, how to combine environment, agriculture and also hospital really in the sense, in, in, in the center of this One Health approach um, is what you showed is one point, what you showed is that the, uh, the occurrence of aspergillus or other fungi, I guess fusarium and so on in the field, of course is reduced when you use azoles. So the question is, does this have any effect on the contamination with mycotoxins of plants uh, in <laughs> organic <laughs> cultivation and in these on these fields where you use azoles? I, I know you have not studied yeah. that, but maybe you... So, so that's an interesting question. We did not study this. It's, uh, uh, it's well conceivable that it does have an effect on all mycotoxins that are introduced during the growth period. So some fungi grow on, on growing plants and then secrete mycotoxins. But you have to keep in mind that a lot of mycotoxins will be introduced after harvesting due to storage of the products and these will most likely not be affected. So uh, I would not uh, assume a, a, a huge effect, but clearly for those fungi that uh, secrete their mycotoxins directly on the, on the crop, this is possible. Thank you very much, but it's really good. But of course, as you said, I also believe that most of the mycotoxins are produced during storage of weeds mm -hmm. and whatever, and then growth of fungi, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other questions? Maybe I don't see one now from the, from the audience. And I would say in the sake of time, we continue and we can discuss at the end, we have the time to discuss all talks at the end. And I would like to come to the next talk that will be given by Thomas Mittenleiter and it's really a great pleasure for him to introduce him. He's the president of the Friedrich Löffler Institute, which has several 
locations, but the, the headquarter mayor also is on the island of Reims. And of course, the Friedrich Löffler Institute is the institute or the institute in Germany, which is responsible to monitor and also to carry out research on, on zoonotic uh, pathogens. Please, Thomas. Thomas, du bist noch stumm geschaltet. You have to switch on your microphone. Sorry. Okay, yes. now. Now you should hear me. Okay, thank you, Axel, and, and uh, welcome to everybody uh, to this session on in the World Health Summit. So this is actually the famous Insel Reims. This is uh, headquarters of the Friedrich Löffler Institute, um, the Federal Research Institute for Animal Health. Um, and uh, this is one of the partners in infect control uh, strung together against infections. So my task is to give you a short introduction and overview on uh, the zoonotic disease aspects, uh, but in particular focusing on One Health, and this has already also been introduced. One Health is the overarching uh, topic uh, in infect control, uh, which actually means that human, animal, and environmental health are closely connected. I mean, they are intersecting. And the more we have a human population, the more we keep animals, uh, the more we hurt environment, the larger this intersecting uh, panel actually goes. Now, basically, it's uh, the, the core is that humans are part of the animal kingdom. Uh, this is sometimes more obvious and sometimes less. Um, but it's also that they share uh, an environment. And these are the three, basically, the three patterns um, that make up One Health. I would like to talk about two so-called and label them pillars of the One Health concept. One is antimicrobial resistance and the second is uh, zoonotic infections. Now within the, the One Health approach within infect control, uh, Max uh, Barkhage already mentioned, we have more than 30 research projects with more than 56 partners. Um, and the one that um, I will deal with focus on diagnosis um, vaccines, therapies, and AMR. Uh, and I just give exemplary descriptions of these five uh, highlighted projects. Now, this is, a, I think, a very nice picture that has actually been drawn by one of the partners in infect control uh, by Lindgren, um, at GmbH. And actually, I mean, this shows the complex interactions between antibiotics use and antibiotic resistance between humans from society and patients, pets, uh, fruit, vegetables, and feed plants, wildlife, of course, food producing animals and animal products. And this all ends up in waste and waste water, and uh, finally in the environment. And one of the projects in, in infect control, which is called anti-res, uh, deals with the um, examination of dissemination of antibiotic resistances in urban wastewaters. So basically combining what gets out of humans, what gets out of agri agriculture and veterinary medicine comes together in wastewater treatment plants. And basically, I mean, this is the collection point where then actually antibiotic resistances come together um, and uh, need to be monitored on one hand and hopefully interfered with on the second. Now for the monitoring aspect, uh, this is a project that involves, uh, that Im employs um, most modern methods uh, in molecular analysis, metagenomics, metatranscriptomics, and metaproteomics to assay not only for the presence of resistance genes, but also for their expression uh, and the impact on, on environmental factors. So basically it deals with the release into the environment. Uh, and what uh, one of the uh, results already is that, of course, there is, uh, um, there are uh, antibiotic resistance genes and bacteria in these wastewaters. Uh, and if we really want to prevent dissemination, uh, we have to treat these wastewaters in addition to the normal treating stages that are uh, already um, established. And this is why this project has actually gone into an extension. Uh, and we now try to use plasma, low temperature plasma based technologies, um, where, we have, where there is an, an institute in Kaiswal to work with that to reduce the dissemination of AMR through urban wastewaters. So it very nicely combines the three factors, um, human um, health, uh, animal health, and environmental health. The second project I would like to briefly uh, mention is MOASIS, Metaomics Analysis of Systemic Effects of Anti-Infective Substances. And basically, it deals with two very important um, infectious agents, not only for humans, but also for animals. 
This is Clostridium difficile, uh, which is becoming more and more a problem in hospitalized se settings, and Salmonella enterica as an, uh, an agent that produces uh, diarrhea. Um, in particular, Clostridium difficile is a part of the normal microbiome um, of, uh, the, uh, of pigs. So basically what we try to do here is to establish a baseline of the pig microbiome and then um, incidentally uh, assay a novel natural compound chlorotonil A, uh, which more or less specifically uh, targets Clostridium difficile. And this was actually shown in, in, in uh, animals in, uh, in experiments in piglets where it had, could actually be shown that there are less side effects on the normal gut microbiome microbiota, but rather a specific effect on Clostridium difficile, which is also now uh, going further on. So basically by using most modern uh, molecular technology with proteomics and metaproteomics and this human related pig model, and this is also one of the One Health aspects, um, we have a new dimension of actually assessing uh, efficacy and, and uh, effects of chlorotonil A. In terms of zoonosis, um, just briefly uh, to mention what are zoonosis. Zoonosis are infectious diseases that are naturally transmitted between humans and other vertebrates. This is a definition from 1959, but I still think it's the most, um, I mean, telltale definition that I can think of. Um, zoonosis, the term does not uh, imply any direction. It doesn't mean it only gets from animals to humans, but it also gets the other way around. And to set a baseline, 60% of existing human infectious diseases are zoonotic or are derived from an animal reservoir. And of the emerging infections, like for example, SARS-CoV-2, uh, more than 75% uh, come from an animal source. So this is highly relevant uh, in terms of infectious diseases. And it's also fair to say, and I think it's an interesting, uh, interesting numbers, uh, the 13 most important, now in this case, endemic zoonosis account for 2.2 million deaths and 2.4 billion diseases, human diseases each year, which means um, um, every uh, third, uh, every, every second um, member of the human population gets infected with uh, a zoonosis once uh, in, in, in a year. Now, these are the 13 endemic most important zoonosis, and one is tuberculosis. Tuberculosis uh, can be transmitted and is mainly transmitted from human to human, but there is also uh, an animal um, facet. So uh, there is animal tuberculosis, and in fact, tuberculosis is a multi-host infectious disease. Now, so far, most of the tuberculosis assays and, and, and studies have been done in mice, now, incidentally, mice are not a normal host for, for tuberculosis bacteria, but livestock, for example, is, including goats. And that's why we set up a, 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 um, an infection model um, under biosafety level three conditions, which is quite a, quite a challenge, in goats by intratracheal infection with Mycobacterium capri, one of the uh, micro, Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex agents. And this is now being used um, to study novel vaccines, novel therapies, and in particular novel vaccines that have also been developed, at least in part, within infect control by the Max Planck Institute for Infection Biology in the group of Stefan Kaufmann. Um, these are genetically modified mycobacteria that have a superior or uh, 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 display a superior um, immunoprotection. And for us, what's particularly important is they also allow something that's very important in animal disease control, so-called DIVA, which means differentiating infected from, from uh, vaccinated organisms, uh, which means you can vaccinate and still detect infection. Two more of, the, of these 13 are brucellosis and Q fever. And also here, um, infect control um, has a project dealing with two these two infection, uh, infectious agents. Uh, this is uh, establishing of pen side tests rapid tests that can be used in the field, can be used in, in, uh, in stables. Um, and basically, I mean, it means to have a handy uh, kind of lateral flow device, ELISA-like uh, um, test available. Uh, this is now pretty much uh, progressed in terms of Coxiella burnettii, uh, the Q-fever agent. I uh, was still working on uh, prosolosis. 
Now, in the last part, I would like to, uh, to come to one more project, and this has to do with the, with the actual situation. And this means zoonotic disease is the spread from an animal reservoir uh, to humans. Um, and uh, this is what actually happened with SARS-CoV-2 as well. So, so an anthropogenic spillover, most likely from horseshoe bats in southern China to humans. To give you a number, I mean, this, this animal reservoir, there are different estimations uh, around, but it just says there is a lot of, in particular, mammalian viruses that are not yet known, that come, that are dormant, I should say, in an animal reservoir that could um, pose a, a, a problem, even a pandemic uh, um, uh, appearance in humans. Now, this can be exotic animals. That's what we have when we're looking to Africa, when we're looking to Asia. These exotic animals are also transported. Um, they are tr traded. And this is, for example, one of these variegated squirrels where we uh, four, three, four years ago found an, a new Borna virus that is uh, causing encephalitis, uh, encephalitic infections in humans. But this doesn't only apply to faraway countries. You can also find new agents directly at your front door. Uh, and this is, for example, a publication from earlier this month uh, where uh, a group in our uh, in institute, together with American colleagues, has shown that uh, relatives of rubella virus uh, are not only found in, in uh, Africa, but also here, and this is the natural host. We have to come and to this, an end. This should, be, and this should be helped with a rapid uh, assay, uh, rodent associated pathogen, uh, pathogen chip detection, um, uh, exactly for that purpose. So, coming to a close, I'm already go, uh, close to being cut up. Um, cut off. Uh, this is human health. We have one health day actually next week. November 3rd is the human uh, is the one health day. Uh, so please pay attention. Keep this in mind. Uh, and with that, I thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thomas, thank you very much for this really nice talk. In the sake of time, I would uh, I would recommend that we just continue. And at the end, we have some questions also for the order of the audience. And then we would. Uh, Ask these questions at the end if you agree. Okay, sure. thank you very much. Okay, then we come to the next talk, which will be given by Professor Petra Gastmeier. And for me, it's a personal really pleasure that she is here today. And she is the director of the Institute of Hygiene and Environmental Medicine at the Charité in Berlin. And she is an expert also about informing and educating the public, patients, doctors, and farmers about antibiotic treatment and handling of antibiotics. August Meyer, please. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah, good morning. And thank you for the opportunity to speak here about informing and educating the public, patients, doctors, and farmers about handling of antibiotics. This figure should show you the development of antibiotic resistance in German ICUs. This is information from the so called ZARI surveillance system, a surveillance system which is uh, covering about 100 ICUs. And you can see here the development between 2001 and 2019. And you can see, we see a decrease of MRSA, but all the other main multi-resistant pathogens are increasing, mainly the gram-negative pathogens. And in Germany, we are using about 1,400 tons of antibiotics every year. And half of this amount uh, is used in the animal sector and the other one, the other half in the human sector. That's why uh, this is really a one health problem. And in the framework of Infect Control 2020, uh, we had the chance to do something in this field. And our project was called Y. Y stands for Rational Antibiotic Use Through Information and Communication. In this project, we work together on one hand, uh, veterinarians and uh, physicians, and on the other hand, also designers and media experts. And we tried to focus on prescribers of antibiotics on one hand, and also on consumers of antibiotics like farmers, patient, patients, and travelers. And for instance, in the veterinary sectors, the colleagues from the veterinary uh, uh, faculty of the Free University Berlin developed a so-called podcast for, for pig farmers and veterinarians. 
And the name of this podcast was Knowledge Between the Ears. The background was that pig farmers and veterinarians do not have enough time for education, but they have time when they went, for instance, from one farm to the other farm. And that's why this podcast was very well accepted. For hospital physicians, we developed train the trainer courses with a special emphasis on diagnostics and re-evaluation of therapy, de-escalation of empiric therapy. This is the most important point, and this was mainly addressed in this uh, sub-project, which was led by the group from uh, Matthias Platz in Jena. And our own group, we concentrated on general practitioners, and we developed tools to support communication between physicians and patients and uh, to allow self-monitoring of physicians and to support um, education. And I would like to show you one of our tools here, uh, the most prominent tool, where the so-called infoscriptions instead of prescriptions. The idea was uh, to give uh, these infoscriptions to patients when they come to the doctor and ask for antibiotics. And this was also very well accepted. And in addition, we produced a so-called infoscription generator. This was a platform. And the doctors could use this platform for downloading these infoscriptions uh, with information about leading symptoms, about explanations uh, of therapy, also alternative therapies. And they were also available in different languages. And finally, we also produced a tap tool uh, this tap tool was used to monitor the own prescription habits by the doctors, and it was also used for benchmarking with other primary care physicians. And in addition, we offer classical teaching uh, courses, the um, different uh, chambers of physicians in the different regions helped us to organize these courses. And we also created MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, together with the Hasso Plattner Institute in Potsdam. And for instance, this is the introductory page of such a MOOC. And the MOOC was a combination of small, um, small courses and also answers and questions. And uh, uh, when I can summary, when I, summar when I try to summary all our activities in this project, uh, I can say, uh, there was a real interest of antibiotic prescribers and consumers uh, to improve their knowledge about antibiotics. Uh, we were able to develop tools, individual designed according to the needs of the individual prescribers and consumer groups, and they were very well accepted and many of them are still available and used. For instance, they were integrated in student courses like the uh, podcast or available as patient information on several websites. Uh, and our MOOC course, uh, here you can see, for example, the first page of our fourth edition of the course. Uh, this course was opened last week. And meanwhile, several thousand general practitioners in Germany have participated in this course, and it was also very, very accepted. Thank you so much. Frau well, Gassmeier, thank you very much for this really very nice presentation showing really excellent research, but also with direct practical outcomes and outreach. So to you and your team and the cooperation partners, really thank you very much. Also, we have some questions, but I would like in the sake of time for, first to continue. And then at the end, we will, we will address the different questions which have accumulated. Uh, so we would come now to an entirely different area which is now to architecture. And for me, it's really a great pleasure to introduce Wolfgang Sunder from the Technical University in Braunschweig, and who is one of the experts, uh, experts uh, thinking or considering uh, hospitals of the future and also considering, let's say, prevention of infectious diseases. So it's really, we are really grateful that you could make it today and we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much for coming, Wolfgang. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Axel Barkhage, for the nice introduction. And of course, it would be a nice pleasure to meet you all in Berlin, in the team, and also on the 
Congress, so maybe next year it's a better time. Um, so my uh, short presentation, um, I would like to um, I would like to introduce you to the Carmen Research Project. And Carmen stands for Hospital Architecture, Microbome, and Infection. The project researches on the infection influence of architecture and design on the transmission of nosocomial infection and multi-resistant pathogens and the colonization of a new hospital with micro, uh, microorganism. The team is interdisciplinary, you can see. We are from the TU Braunschweig as architects, and we have uh, medical science from the Institute um, of Hygiene and uh, Environmental Medicine from the Charité. And from the University Hospital of Vienna, we have uh, molecular biologists, and we have a practical corporate partner, Ruhl, uh, from Waldbüttelbrunn. So what was the starting point of this research project? Uh, as you can see, national and international guidelines call for the isolation of patients with multi-resistant pathogens in single rooms. Some countries, like here you can see the United States or Denmark, have started to plan and to build hospitals with single rooms only in normal care wards. In a joint project, the Charité and Theo Braunschweig have collected data how many single rooms are currently available in Germany. And you can see the result is that 27.1% uh, are currently single rooms in intensive care wards and uh, only 6.4% in normal care wards. So these were the two main questions for our project. Is there a design of a twin room in normal care wards possible? that is an alternative to a single room in terms of infection prevention. But also the role of the hospital microbiome is not fully explored so far. So can research of the hospital microbiome lead to different understanding of single room settings and their clearing and disinfection? So as an architect, um, we need to have the following information to design a patient room. First of all, we need the prioritization of the pathogens. Then, of course, we need the type of transmission, the information on that, for example, through air transmission, direct contact through a vector or um, through surfaces. And through this information, we plan structural constructive and process components. Within the Carmine project, um, we did a pre-analysis, including the study of different two bedroom layouts in normal care wards, which you can see, this is just like an, uh, some examples of uh, tw uh, twin rooms in normal care. And the variety of floor plans we evaluated in terms of space, requirements, floor plans, configuration, furnishing, gives us more and more information how to design the um, twin rooms for our project. So here you can see the layout of the Carmen patient room. The floor plan is systematic and includes two opposites, uh, opposite beds. Each patient has an in, uh, identical one half in size, conditioned and equipment. You can see this size is exactly the same like this size and we give both the same standard. Each patient has his, uh, his own bathroom. The position of the patient bed ensures a good and equal outlook for both patients and a good view of both beds from the patient door. The space is divided in three zones. There is a care zone, which marks the entrance area, the workspace, which is here and here, and the area of the patient beds. The patient zones included the patient beds with its surroundings. And then we have the third zone with the area for patients and visitors with a bench with tables and cupboards. Now I would like to show you some of uh, some pictures of the Carmen patient room. The pictures above shows the two beds facing each other, the access to the bathroom and the patient door. The picture below shows the work area for every patient it integrates a safe disposal of used materials and the access and, uh, of new care materials. 
Now here you can see on the upper picture, the direct link between the patient bed and its own bathroom. Cross-contamination will be reduced in the bathroom. The picture below shows the location of the hand drop dispenser. The position of the beds is intended to help hospital staff to become more conscious about hand disinfection before patient care. The new design of the Carmen bedside table supports the cleaning through few joints and offsets. You can see here that we have also tried to, to have only few joints. It has a lot of space, a clear organization of objects, and in addition, a two slide usability. The second main focus of the Carmen project was the longitudinal hospital microbiome study. The picture above shows the nine room of the neurological ward in which the samples were collected. Collection sites per room were three environmental locations, floor, door handle, and sink, and four patient samples, near rectum, palm, and elbow. The sampling started the week before the opening and, look until, and took until 30 weeks after the first patient occupancy. The samples were analyzed using metagenetic pipelines and sequencing steps and additional PCR tests for the detection of antimicrobial resistant genes. The graph shows bacteria colonization dynamics of the floor, door handle, and sink during the first 30 weeks of patient occupancy. A shows the quant quantitative analysis of bacterial biomass over time measured by quantitative PCR. This is an estimation of the abundance of bacteria per time and shows that the microbiome is building up during the first three to four weeks and then stabilized. B shows the taxonomic summary of changes in the composition of each environmental site over time. Shown is the relative frequency of the collapsed main taxa at family level for each week. Basically, these images show the composition of different bacteria taxa per time and sample site. The analysis shows that each site has a different composition of bacteria, which is specific for each environmental site. Here you can see at the upper graphic, the diversity of environmental samples between sites and over time. The diversity increases over the first weeks and stabilizes afterwards. The lower graph shows influence of patient occupancy on bacterial colonization patterns. These so-called heat maps so show the correlation of bacterial composition of environmental and patient samples for three different weak blocks. Eventually, this image shows that the correlation between environmental and patient samples increase over time, whereas the highest correlation was found, for example, for floor and door handle the lowest correlation for rectum and sink. So thank you very much for all the partners of the Carmen project team and for, of course of, for the, all the industrial partners who helped us construction the um, Carmen patient room. And at the end, I would like to focus um, for one information that we have uh, an exhibition and evaluation of the Carmen patient room on, of, uh, on the Car uh, Charité campus Berlin site starting tomorrow. And if you want to like to book and to see this uh, um, patient room, you can enter at uh, the Carmen website, carmen.info to book um, a slot. So thank you very much for your attention. Wolfgang Grunder, thank you very much for this really impressive talk. And also, I would like to emphasize again what you said already. We have this room now on uh, the campus Charité, Berlin Mitte, live, unplugged. So if you really want to see it, how it looks like the patient's room of the future, please, unfortunately, you have to book a date, an appointment to be able to visit it. And this, of course, is due to the uh, corona pandemics. But this room will be presented to the public this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Exactly. And then until the 22nd of November, we are opening this patient room for, for the public. And uh, we, I would be very happy if a lot of people are coming also for discussion to exchange the results. I think that would be a great opportunity. Thank you very much for this great achievement. 
I would uh, come to the next talk, and then at the end, I'm sure there might be some questions also concerning this talk. And the next talk, and I, it's my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, who is uh, Peter Schmidt from uh, now the company called Siva Animal Health, and he, he is one of the leading experts in Germany, and but also in Europe on vaccines, and in particular on vaccines to help uh, to vaccinate animals. And he used to work with IDT Biologica in Dessau, but then he moved to Siva and also part of the company moved to it. And so we are really grateful. And he's a very strong partner in our infect control consortium. And it's my great pleasure to announce his talk, which will, is devoted to vaccine development with an emphasis on the cooperation of industry and science. Herr Schmid, thank you very much for coming. Okay, thank you for, uh, for the introduction. Um, so um, vaccines are important tools for the prevention of uh, infectious disease in animals and humans and um, research and development in this field therefore fits perfectly with the objectives of infect control. Today, I will talk about vaccine research and development with a special focus on private public collaboration and partnership. Um, I will do this using VACOMI as an example. This is an infect control project that had the ambitious goal of providing prototype vaccines against bacterial infections in humans and pigs. The pathogens are streptococci strep suis in pigs and strep pneumonia in humans. Both pathogens have in common that they occur in many serotypes, they multiply in different host compartments, and there is no vaccine today that protects across serotypes. I will briefly talk about vaccine research and development. Vacumi as an example for a private public vaccine research project the aims of this transsectoral approach, the parties involved, some results and achievements. And finally, I would like to comment on some follow-up activities. For the sake of time, I, I will only refer to the strep suis part of this uh, cooperation. This diagram gives you an overview of the different phases of regular non-pandemic vaccine research and development, its typical duration and costs. Typically, it takes eight to 10 years to bring a new vaccine to the market, especially in the early phases, in the, pre, in the research and preclinical development phase. Uh, there is, it makes a lot of sense for industry and academia to work together. The strength of academia is certainly the basic research, creating a fundamental understanding of the pathogen, the complex processes involved in infection, in host immune response. Um, academia provides here the enabling science and technologies. And another important point is the training of young, talented natural scientists. This is also the core task and the core competency of universities. The later phases, these are more the domain of industry with a lot of formal quality requirements and regulations like the GXPs and regulatory requirements. Industry also has the necessary expertise in vaccine design and human research, but also in scale up and large scale manufacturing. And finally, the distribution of the finished vaccines to make them broadly available to patients all over the world is also competency of the industry. So cooperation makes a great deal of sense to me. This project, the project idea, and the main, main goal of Vacumi was to identify host compartment specific antigens, which alone or in combination provide broad cross serotype protection against the pathogen. The work packages were the identification of antigens by means of in vivo and ex vivo proteomics and RNA sec analysis, the recombinant production and purification of the antigen candidates immune proteome analysis by convalescent sera from pigs, the design, construction, and testing of a multi-component vaccine prototype in challenge experiments in pigs. And finally, the identification of ex vivo correlates uh, for protective immunity. In the consortium, internationally recognized top scientists from the fields of infection biology, 
veterinary medicine, medical research, and bioinformatics worked closely with ex experts from industry. Sven Hammerschmidt, University of Greifswald, one of the world leading experts in strep pneumonia infections, acted as the project coordinator. The working group of Uwe Völker, University Medicine Greifswald contributed its outstanding expertise in the fields of mass spectrometric analysis of proteomes and immune proteome analysis. The University of Leipzig was represented by the groups of Christoph Baums and Gottfried Alber. They provided in vivo samples from strep suis, from different host compartments, and a rich and unique collection of Pixera. They did immunization and challenge experiments in pigs and innumerable immunological analysis. Finally, they investigated ex vivo correlates for protective immunity. The working group of Susanne Häusler from the Helmholtz Center of uh, Infectious uh, Research did the mRNA profiling of in vivo isolated strep suis. And the team of Volker Florian Siva Innovation Center in Dessau provided as suis and gens as recombinant proteins performed immunization experiments in pigs and designed and manufactured the prototype vaccine. Sorry. Finally, Dominic Dries' team from uh, Biocontrol in Jena brought in its expertise in data analysis and big data integration. VACOM is a typical vaccine research and pre-development project. The transsexual cooperation has been very successful and beneficial for all parties involved. The objective of cross-serotype cross, cross protection against strep suis was not achieved, but the immune proteomics application for strep suis was established and validated. A spectral database for strep suis was created a large number of strep suis proteins have been identified which are differentially expressed in vivo in a compartment specific manner. 52 proteins were identified as possible antigen candidates by immune proteomics and a multi-component uh, vaccine was produced from six antigens. This vaccine resulted in high antibody titers, but unfortunately, uh, did not protect in a challenge experiment. Finally, the strep suis induced oxidative burst in blood granulocytes was established as a new in vitro correlate of protection. In summary, I can say that the joint project has generated a great deal of data and knowledge in a very short time. I would like to address two points by way of example, which were possible solely because of the interdisciplinary approach. These are on the one hand, the immune proteomics based identification of putative cross protective antigens. And on the, on the other hand, the strep suis induced oxidative burst as an in vitro correlate of protection. The first example, the identification of the putative cross protective antigens was only possible due to a very close cooperation between different disciplines, Christoph Baum's group, with its in-depth knowledge of the pathogen, its very experimental infection models, and a veritable collection of 80 well-characterized sera from pigs with different immunological backgrounds regarding strep suis. Uwe Völker's group, with their expertise in immunoproteomics, the access to instrumentation supporting high throughput approaches, their expertise in handling large data sets, and finally, Volker Florian's team as the industrial partner providing a large number of highly purified protein antigens. The second example is the strep suis induced oxidative burst as an in vitro correlate for protection. And also this was only possible uh, because of the interdisciplinary approach. Here, especially the working groups of Christoph Baums and Gottfried Alba worked closely together. It's, uh, of course, further research is necessary to demonstrate the suitability of the approach for future vaccine pro projects in the, uh, for, of, of the industrial partner. Eventually, this technique has the potential to reduce animal challenge experiments, at least in the early phase of vaccine development. In the 
Interdisciplinary project presented here a, a huge number, a large number of antigens candidates were identified, which can be used for the development of diagnostic tests, but also as starting points for future vaccine development projects. To integrate the huge number of data and to make them easily accessible and usable for future projects, the partners have initiated a follow-up project, the development of a database in which omics data of different levels are combined with biochemical, physiological, and gene expression data of different strep series and strep pneumonia strains. This database is called the PathoWiki project. So here with, I would like to thank all partners in the consortium for their great cooperation. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Ashmi, thank you very much for this really nice presentation. And it also shows us that it's a long way to develop a vaccine, but also that sometimes it's really very helpful not only to look, let's say, to a human pathogen, but also to an animal pathogen. And then also to see what are the differences, but also what are the common structures which can be tackled by a vaccine. So thank you very much for this and also to speak about where we are when we think about the development of such compounds and where is the collaboration, where does the collaboration starts uh, with industry. Um, before coming to the discussion, I would like to come to the, to the last speaker in this session today. And it's really uh, a great pleasure for me to, uh, to introduce Lothar Wieler, who is the president of, of the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin. And all of you know him from the television on all TV stations. And we are really grateful, Lothar, that you could make it today despite all of your tasks you have at the moment. And we are really grateful also to you and the Robert Koch Institute, how you manage the corona crisis at the moment. He's going to speak about infection prevention or free uh, infection prevention, basically. Lothar, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much to uh, have the pleasure here to uh, address some of the topics that we're working on in uh, infect control. And if you show the next slide, please. Um, as Axel Brackhager in his introduction already mentioned, uh, this is an interdisciplinary, uh, transdisciplinary approach even, which takes human medical and animal and environmental he health research into account. And um, again, I, I, we, we can't stress this often enough. Uh, we have, the, it's crucial, uh, if we aim to, to do research on infectious diseases, it's crucial to have solutions in all of these areas. The next slide shows you that the Robert Koch Institute um, has been involved in various projects here. And we are a member of the consortium since its founding. And um, all our projects are involving the prevention of infections, reaching from lab laboratory research on novel strategies to fight multidrug resistance bacteria, to information campaigns for selected target groups in the public. And um, as you all can see, all these projects that are listed here involve more than one scientific field symbolized by the icons in each box which have been introduced by Axel Brackhage already. So what I want to do is um, I will go into further detail of two projects only. The next slide uh, will highlight these projects. One is uh, where we take care of um, high consequence infectious diseases, which is often obviously also now an interesting project when it comes to COVID. The next slide, please. This project is called ECOS. It's called ECOS, uh, a care for high consequence infectious diseases, patients in hospitals. Well, obviously globalization causes increased incidence, both of high consequence infectious diseases like Ebola, but currently, of course, of COVID-19. And this uh, pandemic is, has an outreach that basically many of us theoretically have foreseen. Actually, the Robert Koch Institute published a paper in 2012 where we exactly have foreseen such a model in, in a model-based approach, such a um, pandemic. But nevertheless, preparation and preparedness for this hasn't been sound enough. So and um, in Germany, we have a very good level of uh, isolation units, the so-called Starkop treatment centers, which are seven uh, um, hospitals in Germany, which do a fantastic job. However, the tertiary care hospitals, including particularly those in remote areas, are confronted with suspect cases of high consequence infectious diseases, sometimes, of course, without being 
adequately prepared. And this is something we're also seeing now. So ECOS aims at strengthening these tertiary care hospitals towards provision of clinical care for patients suffering from high consequence infections before those are referred to the high level isolation units of Starkov. And the project consists of three components, constructional measures. So basically conceptualization and manufacturing of an easy to build up isolation tent, procedural measures, trainings, drafting of training concepts with realization of trainings in tertiary care hospitals. And the third component is the resilience strengthening, basically surveys on current resilience and risk perceptions, which are realized. A communication concept for hospital staff is designed and implemented. And um, these are very, very important tools uh, if you have a certain gadget, but if you don't know how to use it, obviously, we are confronted with a problem. And this is daily practice that people have gadgets, but do not properly use them. So taking into account the involvement of this COVID-19 pandemic, the ECOS project has been expanded, by the way, with activities oriented towards COVID-19 to conceptualization of isolation sleuths for intensive care units, for example. And also we're doing background research on dynamics of aerosolization of SARS-CoV-2, as well as pathogen persistence. And this is performed by projects from Technical University of Berlin, people that are from the physical side, very, very important. We need technology here also. And only if these all come together, we will have a good outcome. The next slide um, gives you short um, view of what has been developed. You see on the left side, a demonstration of the easy to build up isolation tent. Basically the tent can be inflated within several minutes only. And for decontamination purposes, the inner layer can be discharged. The image on the right shows the training of professional hospital staff wearing um, powered air purifying respirators. And um, they perform medical procedures here such as intubation whilst respecting appropriate infection prevention control procedures. The next slide shows you um, how the isolation center basically is set up. It is composed of three areas, red, yellow, and green zone. The red zone is the high risk zone where patients are treated and where wearing of PAPR is required. The yellow zone where there is a medium risk, uh, there's a sluice for PAPR duffing and decontamination of stuff. And this area is composed of two parts a crossover section where the healthcare worker steps from the red into the yellow zone and a decontamination zone. And to the right side, uh, the green zone, the low risk zone where basically wearing of PAPR is not required. So it is a modular tent with ventilation based on piston principle in sluice area. And actually the contamination free air is created within two to three minutes only. Next slide shows you a 3D model of this tent and you can see that basically it is uh, very easy to set up and can be put into place in, in just less than an hour. The second project that I want to um, introduce to you is the next slide. That's um, a, a totally other approach here. It's a vaccination campaign and it's just an, a, an idea flavor of what can be done if you do sound campaigning because obviously and also we've seen this in this pandemic campaigning to the right group is of utmost important that people understand what they have to be take care of. It's called Impfen 60 plus, which means vaccination 60 plus. Next slide, please. Um, this program is particular meant for people for um, um, basically informing people about influenza and pneumococcal diseases and, and vaccination. The project was running from 2016 to 2019 and these two pathogens are the most common cases, causes of pneumonia in, in Germany. And particular people over 60 years are at particular risk for disease, for severe disease outcome. Um, the model region where we did this was uh, the federal state of Thuringia. Some 500,000 inhabitants in this uh, state are 60 years and older. And um, before this, uh, in, before we started this, the influenza vaccination rate was pretty low in this risk group, 46% roughly, and, and pneumococci even worse, 20% only. So the goal of the project was to identify the specific informational interventional needs of these risk groups. So basically why 
don't then know that they should be vaccinated. And up from this to design and implement a targeted intervention to improve vaccination knowledge and improve vaccination attitude and knowledge about sepsis as a sequel. Also we wanted to increase vaccination rates for influenza pneumococci. And uh, the project had two intervention waves, season 2017-18 and season 2018-19. So the next slide uh, gives you an insight into the campaigning, some pictures here. Uh, we produced information flyers, which were displayed in doctors' practices, pharmacies or health insurance companies, or they were found as inserts in magazines in the Thuringian train stations, for example, websites, which took up and explained in more detail the information in the flyer. There, uh, here there was, for example, also knowledge quiz website was also usable mobile, of course. Other websites were from doctor's offices, pharmacies and others could order campaign materials. And also we did outdoor advertising posters and last billboards throughout Thuringia, buses with campaign motors that mainly hit smaller villages. Radio spots on MDR, which is a uh, radio um, sender, I don't know the English term for this, and, and articles also in regional Thuringian newspapers. Next slide. Uh, shows you what have been achieved basically. The, this vaccine 60 plus intervention had significantly, significantly improved the knowledge about vaccine preventable infectious diseases, as well as knowledge about sepsis as a possible uh, secondary disease. It also improved the risk perception of influenza and confidence in pneumococcal vaccination. The contact with the campaign led to more intensive thinking about own vaccination protection. Also, the evaluation of the rates of influenza, they, uh, we see that there was a slight improvement in vaccination coverage. However, it is conceivable that local effects of the campaign on vaccination uptake were not visible in the data that we had because there were also relevant disturbance variables. For example, the comparison with the temporal developments in other German states supported, however, the comparison uh, with the temporal developments in other German states as control regions supported the interpretation of, of our results. So coming to the next, uh, last slide. Um, so I, I briefly sum it up because this again shows our whole infect control um, uh, workload here. So the project that I showed you, they demonstrate that the cooperation, for example, between architects, medical doctors, engineers, and communicational scientists can target all the necessary aspects of the given task. And with this combination of expertise, not only uh, was an isolation tent usable in the hospital room designed, but also the necessary training sessions and information campaigns for the hospital workers. These also could be designed and implemented. And I think this is a step that is particularly strong in infect control because we also implement what we are doing here in, in science. And I think this is the utmost step. We, we can't stop at the bench and in our laboratories. And also we involve psychologists, medical doctors and design experts. So that lead to a successful information campaign about the vaccination as I've shown you before. So to conclude, I have to say that uh, in fact control is a well-established inter and even transdisciplinary German wide network putting the theoretical one health approach into reality. And this map again shows you all the infect control partners locations in Germany, highlighting the five innovation laboratories that have already been mentioned by Axel Barkage, which are located in the five main partner locations, Berlin, Greifswald, Braunschweig, Jena, and Würzburg. And with this, I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you very much. Buda, thank you very much for this really nice example showing that what you said and what you vigorously said, implementation of that, what we, the research we are doing, we have been doing, but also the development, then we need to implement that, what we have found out, and beautiful examples. Thank you very much for that. Now, I would like to start with questions which came from the audience. And I would like to start with the first question, which is which addresses the talk of Thomas Mettenleiter. And I just read, I read the text, Thomas, the, the question. Has the FLI tested successful implementations to reduce or tackle EMR that are relevant to low and middle income countries? 
If yes, could you briefly describe one example? Yeah, with the projects that I mentioned, we are still in a proof of concept stage. Uh, so this is not yet something that has to, uh, the, the capacity to roll out in, in, uh, into other countries. But uh, tomorrow morning, actually, there will be an event here at the World Health Summit um, as, uh, on, under the auspices of the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, and this is also a One Health uh, issue. And FLI is also part in this, in this event as well. Um, so basically, um, as soon as we have more information and more data on that, uh, I don't see any obstacle at all uh, that this can be then rolled out into, into other uh, uh, countries as well. This is the goal, but we are still at the experimental stage at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much for the answer. There is another question to Lothar Wieler. And uh, it, it says, if there was one intervention that you could implement in LMICs to reduce infections, what would that be? I think it's a tricky question because maybe it's more interventions you need, Lothar, sorry. <laughs> I actually don't, in, in LMICs, Oh, this is low and middle income. Uh, okay, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. It came well, to me later. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very clearly. I can only, um, just so from the experience that we have, just uh, uh, during COVID, so far we have supported 63 countries uh, in their fight against um, COVID-19. Yeah, this is the current number. And we're doing this by three approaches. Uh, missions by people from us to particular countries, uh, sending equipment and teaching people. And the most important here is, um, you know, what, what is going on is that a, a disease is spread and it can only be spread if people behave not, don't, do not behave properly. They don't have a true, true risk perception. So prevention and control, this is the most important issue here. And we have to prevent particularly infections in hospitals, you know, no the common infection. This is really at the center of this. Each and every pandemic is driven in the hospitals. If you think back to Wuhan, this was driven by Wuhan hospitals where the infectious disease could spread and it could spread because people weren't prepared for infectious persons. So uh, protection, hygienic measures in hospitals and in, in ambulatories also, of course, this is the most effective way to contain a disease if it comes to medical intervention. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's the intervention at the early beginning, looking that a pathogen cannot spread, don't giving it a chance to be spread. So this is why we do a lot of teaching in Nigeria and in other countries. We have various programs where particularly in hospitals and in ambulatory practices, we teach people with hygienic methods to prevent infection. Thank you very much. I've, I've got another question by email and saying to, to Petra Gastmeier, if I just can phrase the question. And it, it concerns education and information. It is an important part when fighting infections. But how can we make sure that we not only educate people who know that anyway, and how can we, let's say this was a question, how can we create impact in patients who might be, or, or people, and they're not patients, individuals, who might not be entirely convinced of that, what we are, what we are doing in education. I mean, it's a tricky question also, <laughs> I think. Yeah, but I think it's a very important point. Um, ma mainly, I'm working in the field of nosocomial infection prevention. And in the past, we have tried to use the one size fits all approach, that means, uh, we try to use the same prevention measures for every patient. But now we have much more infections which are due to the endogenous flora of the patients. And that's why it's much more important to, to develop concepts of personalized uh, preventive medicine. And in, in this aspect, it's so important to, to improve the knowledge of the patients to create websites, to, uh, to make consultations, for instance, uh, prior to operations. And I think there is a lot of, of um, room for improvement in this field. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, uh, thank you very much. There was another question which I got, uh, which was addressing the talk of Wolfgang Sunder. And, and uh, one point is what people were not surprised, but what was interesting to see that we had this interdisciplinary work, and in particular between architects, what you mentioned already, let's say, and medical personnel. How does that work? Do you understand each other, you know, the architects, the doctors, and the, I mean, <laughs> and so on. How do you think is the future? Do you think we should have a novel education system? This is something what was in, uh, intended in this question, that we have, let's say, experts who are experts in both fields, or what do you think? I think this is one of the most important uh, points, also for infection control and also for this consortium. Um, I think we have to understand each other. I think this is the main thing. I'm, I'm an architect, so I don't know exactly um, the knowledge of uh, medicine, but to exchange and to work interdisciplinary, this is one of the most important points. Also, Lothar Wieler just mentioned that training is also important when we are starting to plan, for example, an isolation unit. It is only workable if people understanding how to train within those rooms and also with the Carmine project, we also need to focus what um, the staff is saying, what medicines are telling us, cleaning persons. So this interdisciplinary focus is very important. And um, I think with this, we have gained a very big step nowadays, but I think we have to focus on how to get more exchange in a kind of standardization way. I think this is very important that it's not losing, that it's not focused only few people who are getting those knowledge that it's getting into a brighter field. And I think this would be also for infect control. I think this would be a big, big thing to, to establish this interdisciplinary and practical part. It's a good point also to have an educational part for fostering interdisciplinary languages or whatever yeah. how we could call it yeah. Mm. yeah absolutely thank you very much there is another question i've selected one uh, for peter Sch peter schmidt and this uh, concerns the ppp models you discussed you know the private public partnerships and what we see maybe i can just comment that what i see at least this is in the field of new antimicrobials when you think about antibiotics but also a bit in vaccines that it's not really profitable for huge companies, you know, huge pharmaceutical concerns. And, and what we discuss, of course, I'm not the expert you are, is that how can PPP models help? And maybe you can elaborate on that. Might be it help that you have a company which is specialized on one sector, so there is no internal competition, let's say, with new drugs, new vaccines against cancer or whatever. Or how can we solve this problem that the market cannot solve these problems anymore? I think the the, okay, the bridge, sorry <laughs> no, no. Uh, the, the, the pretty for, for, for industry is uh, if, if you have the basic research the basic the basic studies done by by the uh, public sector by academia uh, maybe up to the to the point where you have a kind of proof of concept uh, then it becomes interesting uh, for industry so uh, you you have a kind of of de-risking uh, if you if you do the basic work in academia, this is this is where you have let's say 99% failures. So, and if you take out this attrition rate and increase the success probability, it's it's more and more uh, interesting also for big pharma to to invest into these topics. The other the other point certainly is is um, what is the attractiveness of a segment like anti-infectives. So, if you have at one one side, you say okay. Uh, prudent use, use as, as uh, small quantities as possible. And at the other end, you have to, to uh, have a return on investment of more than a billion. Uh, you need to have a kind of balance here. So that means these medicines, uh, if you want to make them available only in very selected cases, these new antibiotics, for example, they need to have a very high price. Yeah, that's, that's uh, the other point here. I think this is what we also do tell, have to tell the society, I think, really. Yeah. But may I just ask this de-risking, what you said, we know that the industry wants to start very late to reduce risks. But on the other side, we have a gap of financing, you know, to finance uh, 
preclinical trials, clinical phase one, two. It's not possible with normal money, I would say, from public money. We try that now in infect control and the data for some very selected projects. But I don't think it's a, it's a solution for many projects, maybe just for a few. Um, as, I, as I said, if, if you have the proof of concept, if you have, for example, convincing data in animal experiments, uh, this, is, this uh, increases the interest uh, of, the pharmaceutical, uh, of pharmaceutical industry. Uh, there, there are uh, uh, examples of infectious of infections which are not not very interesting due to the the uh, opportunity you have later on to to make money out of that infection. If you have very very rare diseases, yeah, uh, I think you need you need to have different models. Yeah, you have yes. you have to have uh, you need to have different models and maybe uh, the involvement of non governmental uh, organization because this cannot be regulated by the market alone. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm just looking, I don't see, uh, ah, there's another question. I just look whether it's, uh, sorry, it just popped up. Ah, uh, there is a question to, to uh, Petra Gastmeier. I, I don't know if you can see it yourself. It says, you explained that GPs accepted in majority general practitioner, practitioners, sure. as, uh, uh, doctor, doctors, accepted in majority the infoscription, but did you receive any feedback from the GPs who were skeptical about this kind of info subscription? If yes, can you name one example? Yes, of course. Uh, some general practitioners prefer to speak directly with the patients, um, but uh, many general practitioners feel to have not enough time to speak extensively about the problem of antibiotic usage with the patients. And at least for these doctors, it was very helpful to use these uh, info sets. Yes, this is what I can imagine. I think there is no further questions in the chat. And, and with this, we are just at the end of our session. And with this, I would again like to thank you all for this really beautiful presentation. And also, please, I would like to use the opportunity to, to thank the Federal Ministry of uh, Education and Research for financing this, what we have seen today. I still believe beautiful consortium, in fact, control this is, that is aimed to do on the one side research, but on the other side, also practical implementations. And I, I think we have seen today really beautiful examples for these implementations. So again, to all of you in this busy time with the corona pandemic, thank you very, very much for joining this discussion round and for your really excellent talks. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.